it's those who read our MRI journal are already very familiar with Mark O'Neill, born in London, educated in Oxford, and had a very distinguished career as journalist already in Ireland. He was reporting on the troubles in Ireland. And then he moved to Asia in 1978, where he was a journalist in different cities in China. You may remember his brilliant article on uh, the Buddhist movement Suji in our MRI journal, and just published 13 books on history of China. The upcoming book is his autobiography, but we feel very happy that we have Mark tonight because in these times we look for inspiration. We ask ourselves, is there any reform going on in political systems, especially in China? So for this, uh, we turned to this inspiring figure of Dr. Hu Shi uh, as one of the greatest uh, intellectuals of the last century, deeply inspiring and giving us a sense of optimism. So. Uh, Mark, we were very glad to have you and uh, my deepest thanks for all your numerous contributions to the Macau Rich Institute. And so over to you, uh, Mark, thank you very much for sharing your insights with us. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosalyn and St. John's Joseph University for hosting the talk today. It's a great honor to speak at such a famous institute of learning. And I gave uh, Dr. Rothlin the name of the Macau bookshop that sells this book. But if you can't find a copy, please send me an email and I'll be happy to send you one. Dr. Hu was one of the most important intellectuals of China in the last century. He was one of the leaders of the new cultural movement, Xin Wenhua Yundong, and one of the most important pioneers of vernacular Chinese, Bai Hua Wen. That's probably his biggest contribution to China. During World War II, he was ambassador of the Republic of China in Washington. He was the chancellor of Beijing University, and he wrote 44 books, three of them in English. So he really had an extraordinary life. So this is a photograph of him when he was university student. And I chose this one because uh, he had this expression of optimism and curiosity that he had throughout his life. You'll see in all the photographs, whatever is happening around him, he preserved this attitude on life, which is very inspiring for us. Now, he was born in December 1891. His father was a very high official of the Qing government, uh, and he married three times and uh, whose mother was the third and the final wife. And uh, he was born in Shanghai, but his father was then sent to Taiwan. And this is just the moment when China has given up Taiwan to Japan. So the Japanese uh, army has arrived in the north of Taiwan, and the Taiwanese are not going to accept this agreement. Uh, so they start a resistance to the Japanese occupation, and his father was chosen by the Taiwanese in southeast Taiwan to lead the resistance, but it fails. The Japanese military is very advanced, and his father has to escape, and he goes to Xiamen, and he dies in Xiamen, and uh, Hu is only four years old. So then his mother and uh, Hu return to the family home in Jixi Anhui. So he barely knew his father. So this is the family home in Anhui, and it was quite a wealthy family, but there were three wives and many children, and the main breadwinner, that's the father, had died. And as Mao, Mao, Mao Zedong liked to say, your render defunct drew your Mao Dun. So the family was wealthy, but there were a lot of conflicts, especially between the wives. 
and whose mother was the third wife, so she was the lowest in status. So the life was comfortable, but uh, full of conflict and difficulties. And the young man, uh, Husher, was an extremely talented student. So even at a very early age, he mastered many uh, characters and was able to read Chinese classics uh, even before he was 10. Now, his early schooling was in uh, the village. His uh, family hired the tutors for him, but his mother made a very uh, sensible decision that for him to advance in his education, he should go to Shanghai. And of course, Shanghai was the most advanced city in China at that time. And most of Shanghai was not controlled by the Chinese government. It was controlled by the British, the French, and the Americans. And in Shanghai, you had schools which were not available anywhere in China, modern schools, which taught a modern curriculum. And by sending his son, her son to Shanghai, her mother, in effect, lost him because he then spent his life in Shanghai and then he went abroad. But she did it because she thought this was the best future for him. Now, the last thing he did before he went to Shanghai for schooling was to be become engaged. Now, he was 12 and his uh, wife-to-be was 13. And she was the daughter of a prominent family uh, near, near to GC. And she, of course, was a child of her gener of her time, which meant to say she had a bound feet and she had no formal education, so she could not read. So, as we shall see, during their life, the two really had very little in common. He became this enormous intellectual and his wife remained a, a very traditional Chinese woman uh, who could not read and had very little interest in what, who was doing. But this was the marriage arranged when he was 12 and she was 13. And then after this engagement, then he goes to Shanghai to attend schooling. So this is a photograph of how Shanghai looked when he arrived there uh, in, uh, in the early 1910s. So he attends three schools in Shanghai, and all of them are modern schools. And this is a great blessing for him. So he learned uh, modern subjects. He learned mathematics and geography and English and ethics and poetry. And the, the schools were very open. Uh, the teachers encouraged the students to, to discuss things and express their own opinions. And uh, it was just the end of the Qing dynasty. So it was really a revolutionary atmosphere. And of course, by being in Shanghai, the schools and the students and the faculty had a freedom they didn't have if they had been in the Qing dynasty controlled area. So uh, Dr. Hu threw himself into this and he edited student magazines and he wrote many articles and he protested against the, the, the lack of education for women and against foot binding and many other social evils of the time. And in 1910, a friend of his suggested that he apply for a scholarship to go to the United States. And as you know, the United States gave back some of the Boxer Indemnity Fund and used this money to pay for Chinese students to go and study in America. Of course, it was not a selfless act. It was intended to make Chinese pro-American. And in the case of Dr. Hu, they were extremely successful. So, he goes to United States, and this is the university he attends first, and it's Cornell, which is in upstate New York in Ithaca. And he was so lucky to go to Cornell because, first of all, they had a, a very broad international faculty. So he met Indians, Filipinos, Japanese, Koreans. He met people from all over the world. And the second thing was that they were one of the few universities in America to admit women. So they had uh, not a large number, but a small number of American women studying there. And these ladies were, of course, the intellectual equal of all the male students. And for someone like who, this was something he couldn't believe. I mean, never in his life had he met women like this. 
So he stays in Cornell for five years. Uh, he starts by studying ag ag agriculture, and then he's, he, he turns to philosophy. And of course, the year after he goes there, uh, we have the Xinhai Revolution in China, and uh, China becomes a republic. And everyone in Cornell wants to know what's going on there. So he becomes a very popular public speaker. And this is a very good thing for him because he gets to improve his, his spoken English. He gets to meet a, a wide section of the community in, uh, in Ithaca. And he takes a course in public speaking. So he becomes very gifted at making public presentations, which is a very good skill to have. Now, this is the lady that he met among the lady students. She's called Edith Williams. And she was the love of Doctor Who's life. So they have a friendship that lasted for 50 years and included 300 letters. And by the grace of God, these letters were not destroyed during all these political movements in China. All the letters that she sent to Doctor Who were in Beijing University. And because they were in English, the Red Guards couldn't understand them and they didn't burn them. So later, a Chinese professor from America found these letters and wrote this wonderful book, which is a summary of the letters by both sides. And this book was invaluable for my, uh, for my biography. Now, Edith Williams was a very unusual woman. She was the daughter of a geology professor. She herself was a student of modern art. She was highly educated, very articulate and very independent. And she had a father who was willing to encourage her in all this. Now her mother was a more conservative woman, of course, and wanted her to get married soon to a, a man with a good profession and a high income and a high status. But her father said something different. It was just up to her. Whether or not she married was up to her. So she was very fortunate to have such a father. And uh, Doctor Who was just hypnotized by a woman like this. And he, as I say, he'd never met any woman like this before in his life. And uh, they became very close friends in, in Cornell and for the rest of their lives. Now, after five years in... Um, Cornell. Uh, he moved to Columbia in New York, and this is the main campus of Columbia in Manhattan. And the main reason he went was he wanted to study under a American professor called John Dewey. And Dewey was one of the most prominent public intellectuals in America of that time. And Doctor Who particularly liked his main theory, which was experimentalism, which was that every problem is capable to find a solution provided we use the scientific analysis, we carefully research the problem, and we can find a solution. And who found this a very attractive way of thinking? And it was one that he, he uh, accepted and he kept for the rest of his life. And he liked uh, Professor Dewey so much that he later invited him to come to China. And Dewey stayed for 26 months. He gave 200 lectures all over China. And his writings were published in 140,000 editions, 140,000 versions were published in China. And this was a great thing which uh, who did to invite him and arrange for this big itinerary in China. So he spends two years in Colombia, and uh, he gets his uh, PhD, and then he returns to China after seven years. Now, throughout this time in China, he and the other Chinese students are debating ferociously the question of what should be the written language of China. Now, as you know, for centuries, Wen Yanwen, classical Chinese, was the written language and perhaps 2%, 3% of the population could read this because it was very complex and it took years to master. 
and for who and the other reformers, this was absolutely absurd. China could never become a modern nation with such a small rate of literacy. So he said the written language should be vernacular, that is the language that people spoke. And he debated this with his fellow Chinese students in America, and he wrote articles about it, which he had published in China. And so I, I include, this is, this is a poem actually about the two butterflies, and it's written to Edith Williams actually. Now she, she, she couldn't read it, but I guess he was so moved that particular day by her that he couldn't help himself and he wrote, wrote this poem uh, in her honor. And this is in uh, vernacular Chinese. So he said that Wen Yan Wen, the literary language was a dead language and that China should get rid of it and they should switch completely to vernacular. And of course, amongst many intellectuals in China, there was intense uh, opposition to this. But that was his view, and he, he expressed it in articles that were published in China. So this magazine, Xin Qingnian, The New Youth, was a magazine edited by Chen Du Xiu, who was one of the founders of China's Communist Party. And this article by Hu, advocating the vernacular, made him very famous before he'd even returned to China. And this article was read by thousands of people in China and had an enormous impact. So he stays in America for seven years and his experience there is extremely positive. He, me he meets many American people. He met people at the top of American society, uh, professors, lawyers, bankers, he was very much at ease with them. They invited him to, to, to join them in their homes for picnics, for artistic outings. He had an experience in America, which is the complete opposite of most Chinese in America at that time, who of course were workers. They were in New York, they were in San Francisco, they worked on the railway, they worked in restaurants, they worked in laundries. They had a very negative experience. They experienced great discrimination by Americans, but he had the opposite. So throughout his life, he remained very favorable to America and he spent 21 years of his 71 years in America. So he comes back to, to Beijing and he is invited to be a professor of philosophy at Beijing University. And the reason for this was that the, the, the principal of the university was Tsai Yuanpei, who was like him a reformer. So he didn't want to have traditional Chinese professors. He wanted teachers that thought like him. So he hired uh, Hu. So he was only 26, he was a professor. He brought his new wife from Anhui. They live in a 17 room uh, house in a Hutong, very lavish. And he starts his work as a professor and he earns 280 yuan a month. And at that time in Beijing University, there was a, a man from Hunan province, very uncouth, a man who never brushed his teeth, who spoke with a very thick accent that very few people could understand. And he earned eight yuan a month as an assistant in the library. I wonder if you can guess who I'm speaking about. Anyway, one day this man, Mr. Mao Zedong, goes to one of uh, Dr. Hu's lectures, but he doesn't have a student uh, pass, so he's not allowed to attend the lecture. So there's a nationwide intense campaign against Hu Shi arranged by Chairman Mao. So we think that moment and that envy toward him was the start of his anger against uh, Hu Shi. So, as a professor at Beijing University, Hu Shi is extremely active. He has many classes. He teaches them in a, a very modern way. He, he invites the students to discuss with him. He's a very popular lecturer. And he's also very uh, productive in writing articles, giving public uh, speeches outside university. And he invites foreign scholars to China. 
So it's John Dewey, whom I mentioned, Bertrand Russell, and also Rabindranath Tagore from India. And he has to arrange everything. He has to arrange the funding. He has to arrange where they stay. He has to arrange interpreters. So it's a great deal of work. But he feels that uh, Chinese people should be allowed to, to, to be exposed to such people. And during this period in the early 1920s, the government accepts his plan to give up classical Chinese and accept vernacular. So the, the primary schools textbooks all use vernacular Chinese <laughs> and the media, newspapers and magazines, they also switch. So this has a dramatic effect on China. And of course it raises the literacy rate of Chinese five, sixfold. So here's uh, his wife and they had three children, two sons and one uh, girl. And the girl died young. So only two of the sons survived. And this is the poem that he wrote when the son was born. And in the Chinese context, especially at that particular time, this is a revolutionary poem, which is to say uh, he, he didn't want to have a son. I mean, Chinese men, this is their number one duty in life is to have a son. But uh, he, he, he said, I didn't want one. And the, the son just arrived on his own. And I think this was part of his attempt to change the traditional thinking toward the family. He'd accepted the ideas of Edith Williams in Cornell and her family that whether or not you marry is up to yourself, who you marry is up to yourself, and whether you have children is also up to yourself. There should be no social obligation to do this. Of course, while he's in this mind frame, he and his wife have very little to talk about to each other. So of course he seeks uh, friendship among ladies outside. And he has an affair in 1923 with uh, a lady very much like uh, Edith Williams, uh, young Chinese, very educated, very independent. And the lady becomes pregnant. So he asks his wife for a divorce. So his wife takes out the knife, the, the vegetable knife in the kitchen and says that she will first kill the two sons and then she'll kill herself, and then he can have his divorce. So he backs off. So he doesn't ask for a divorce, and the rest of his life, he never asks for a divorce. He accepts his wife as his wife for the rest of his life. So the 1920s are a very prolific period for him. He writes uh, several books, and this is one of them. This is the, the, the outline of Chinese philosophy. He also writes a history of vernacular literature. And two of his colleagues at Beijing University, which is Chen Du Xiu and Li Da Zhao, found the Communist Party, and they invite him to join. But he, he doesn't want to join. He remains throughout his life very opposed to communism. He has understood what's going on in, in the Soviet Union. And he's very suspicious of any, what we call isms, you know, things that offer a, a, a total solution for anything. He says this is completely against the spirit of Professor Dewey and against the spirit of scientific research. So he visits Moscow, he visits the UK, the US and Japan. And at the end of the twenties, uh, life in Beijing is so chaotic that he moves and he stays for three years in um, Shanghai. Now, I think you know what this picture is. This is uh, the Guangdong army in Manchuria. So after Japan overtakes Manchuria, um, <clears throat> who starts to have contact with the, the Chinese government, uh, including President Chiang Kai-shek? And Chiang Kai-shek is eager to get advice from people what to do facing the Japanese menace. So. President Chiang explains to him the situation, which is that the Imperial Japan, Japanese Army has nearly 4.5 million soldiers, 2,700 planes, and the, the National Chinese Army has just 1.7 million soldiers and 300 planes. So in other words, there is no point 
for the Chinese army to attack the Japanese army directly. The best strategy is to try to buy time, build up its military, negotiate, and try to persuade a Western power, France, Britain, United States, to join China in fighting Japan. And President Jiang explains this in great detail to uh, Hu Shi, and he understands the policy of the government. So in this picture, he and President Jiang are together, and they're quite amicable in this photograph. But actually, their relationship, which lasts uh, you know, until the 1960s, is very um, conflictual. And they have many arguments. And uh, on the one hand, Jiang greatly respects him. But on the other hand, feels he's, a, he's an intellectual who knows nothing about governing China. He's got too many uh, ideals and believes that many of Dr. Hu's ideas are completely impossible to implement in China. So in Ju June 1935, this is uh, Hu's forecast for China's fighting against Japan. And his analysis is completely accurate. In fact, China has to fight on its own for six years, not four years, but six years. So this is the Imperial Japanese Army occupying uh, Beijing in 1937. And fortunately, uh, his wife and the second son managed to escape. And they bring with them 70 crates of manuscripts, which is a wonderful thing for Hu. And at that time, he was in Nanjing, which was the capital. And their other son was studying in, in the interior of China. So. Chiang Kai-shek asks him to go to America and lobby to bring America into the war. So he's rather reluctant to become an official of the government, but he believes it's his patriotic duty to do it at this critical moment. So he accepts the mission to become our ambassador in Washington in 1938. And I'm putting this picture to explain that the American public, a huge majority of the public, was against any involvement in a war in Europe or in Asia. That was the reason they went to the United States, to escape from the endless wars, religious wars, nationalist wars, feudal wars in Europe. So they did not want to take part in any wars. So it was going to be a very difficult mission for Doctor Who to persuade the US to join the war in Asia. So he spends the first three years uh, traveling from one university to another, giving interviews to the media, meeting high level officials, pleading eloquently that the United States should support China in its war with Japan and that China cannot defeat Japan on its own. And he has many admirers and sympathizers among the high levels of government, including President Roosevelt, but they don't dare to move against the public opinion, which is so much isolationist. And he becomes quite full of despair. He can't, he's not able to, to, to move them. So this is a nice picture to show what good relations uh, who has with the highest levels of the American government. I mean, he had a personal relationship with all these people. So finally, in 1941, the relations between Japan and China and, and the United States are deteriorating. Uh, the US has cut off oil supplies to, to Japan. And the Japanese military regards this as an act of war. And so it's sends the fleet from Yokohama to attack Pearl Harbor. But while the ships are at sea, and it's a long journey, there is negotiations in Washington between the Japanese ambassador and the US government. And the two sides reach an agreement. And if both sides sign the agreement, then the fleet will turn back and will not attack Pearl Harbor. So. All the Allied governments sign it, Japan signs it, but the US has not signed. So 
Doctor Who sees the text of this agreement, and there is no mention of Japan withdrawing its troops from China. In other words, the US is accepting the Japanese invasion of China. So, who demands a meeting with uh, President Roosevelt? He's given a meeting with him, and for the first time in his life, he loses his temper. And please imagine the scene in the White House. Uh, Doctor Who is from Anhui. He's small, right? He's a Chinese. He's small. Uh, Roosevelt is a big man. He's a very big man, a very imposing person. But who feels there is no alternative? This is the moment he must seize to get America into the war. So he uses all his eloquence and all his charm, and he persuades Roosevelt that he cannot accept this agreement because it allows Japan to keep its troops in China. So Roosevelt is persuaded, although he knows politically it's not the right thing to do. He doesn't sign the agreement. And when the Imperial War Council in Tokyo get the news, they tell the fleet to go on and they attack Pearl Harbor. So this is the famous speech on the next day, December 8th, 1941. This is the day that will live in infamy, if you remember. And because it was a direct attack by Japan against the US without apparent provocation, that changed the US opinion and they supported the war. Doctor Who has achieved his mission. So he resigns in September the next year as ambassador. He's very happy to leave politics. It's not his world. And then he spends the next uh, four years uh, living in New York. He does research, teaching, writing. Uh, he has many friends, Chinese friends, American friends, and he has uh, not one, but two American lady friends who, are, who whom he's very close to. Now, at the end of World War II, uh, the Chinese government invite him to, to become the, the chancellor of Beijing University. So he takes up this post in uh, 1947. Sorry, 1946, excuse me. So he's full of hope when he arrives in China, but of course the Chinese Civil War is, is underway. January 1947, George Marshall, the American mediator, leaves because he's given up trying to bring the two sides together. And from then on, there is an all-out war between the nationalists and the communists. So the, the campus of Beijing University is full of protests, demonstrations, sit-ins, um, big character posters. It is the worst possible atmosphere for academic study. And of course, there is no money available for all the ambitious plans that he has for development of Beijing University, in fact, the universities of China. Um, and uh, President Jiang invites him to become prime minister and then invites him to be the presidential candidate in the 1948 election. But he declines both of these offers. So this is a photograph of him at that time at Beijing University. And please take a note of the expression. This is a very un like expression he's got. You can see his despair, hopeless. He, he, he can't do anything. He can't be a proper university leader. So this is a very sound who at this moment. November 16th, 1948, President Jiang sends an airplane to uh, Beijing to evacuate the intellectual elite of the city. Now, the communist armies have surrounded Beijing. So this is the only way to get out. There is no land or sea exit. So Dr. Hu understands very well what would happen to him if he remains in communist China. So he's very keen to take the plane as, as is his wife, but they cannot persuade their son to take the plane. And this is a very a tragic moment because uh, who explains to his son that his son is not an individual. He's the son of Hu Shi. You know, the communists detest Hu Shi. So if he remains, he will be punished. But his son doesn't 
believe them. So he stays behind. So they fly to Nanjing. And then in April the next year, he takes a ship to the United States and <clears throat> never returns to the mainland. So this is one of his many books. So um, the choice of Doctor Who is to go to Taiwan because he still believed that he could build a free and democratic China in Taiwan, it, it, although it's not possible in the mainland. But his wife uh, said, went to Taiwan, didn't like it at all, and said she wanted to live in New York. So they live in New York. And remember, throughout World War II, whilst Doctor Who is in America, you know, very comfortable, very safe, his wife and uh, their second son are living in, in Shanghai. So she has suffered a great deal on behalf of her husband. So in New York, he becomes a library curator. Uh, he does writing and research. And then uh, Chairman Mao launches this fierce attack on uh, uh, Hu. Uh, all the Chinese writers are required to write essays and books criticizing him. And in total, eight volumes are published. And Hu is asked about this by journalist in America and he just he laughs it off he says this means that I will become famous all over China because everyone will have to read my works in 1957 we have the anti-rightist movement and just as he had predicted his son is declared a rightist and the son cannot work he cannot have friends he cannot uh, go out with women he cannot get married He's driven to despair, so he hangs himself, and the family do not find this out for several years. So it's in the summer of 1953 that uh, Miss Williams invites Dr. Hu and his wife to spend a month with her in their house in Ithaca. So this is the only time that the two main women in whose life meet each other. Now, Miss Williams is a very sophisticated lady. So she, she uh, knows that Mrs. Hu is a very good cook. So she goes to great trouble to, to buy a lot of cooking ingredients, which uh, Mrs. Hu can use. And when they leave at the end of the month, she gives her a gift of uh, cooking utensils engraved with her name. Now, can you imagine in Ithaca, New York, finding someone with the ability to engrave her characters on, on, on all of the utensils? It was not an easy thing, but Miss Williams managed to find someone able to do this. So I think um, we could probably make a TV series about that month and the exchanges between the two ladies. <coughs> and luckily for who? They could not speak directly to each other because Miss Williams didn't speak Chinese and or Mrs. Hu could speak English. So I imagine he was uh, very busy interpreting and changing the words spoken by the two ladies. Now, while he lived mainly in New York, he remained very active in Taiwan. And this was one of his projects, uh, this is Free China. And this was published in Taiwan in the 50s, and uh, it was demand that the nationalist government allow a multi-party system and media owned by people other than the government. So this was a magazine of which he was the, the editor, one of the editors. Now, 1958, uh, he was invited to become the head of Academia Sinica in Taipei. And he was able to persuade his wife that uh, this was such an honor that he was able to move to Taipei and hold this position. So he holds this position for four years. And uh, one of the things he did very soon after his arrival was to propose to President Chiang they should set up a, a national council on science development because 
he was asking what is the future of Taiwan? You know, Taiwan cannot just depend on its uh, agricultural um, products, nor can it be just a base for preparing to recapture the mainland, which was President Jiang's main mission in life. We must also develop scientific and technological sector. And now, as you know, today, Taiwan is one of the greatest technological powers in the world. And in terms of semiconductors, Taiwan is far and away the world leader. And so these developments were all started by Dr. Hu, even though he himself was not a specialist in science or, or technology. Uh, in 1961, he has two heart attacks. He spends a long time in hospital. This is the final picture of him and Miss Williams. It was taken in New York airport. She has sold her house in Ithaca and she's retiring in Barbados. So both of them realize they are not going to meet anymore. So this is the final meeting between them. So I think it's a really wonderful photograph. You can see that the, the, the love between them, which began you know, in the 1910s has lasted for, for 50 years. And she takes with her to Barbados all the letters which Dr. Who has written to her. She edits them, I guess takes out some of the more personal material, and then she, she sends it to the, the Hoosier Memorial Hall after his passing away because she considers his his letters are not for her, but uh, his letters are for all of uh, mankind. So finally, in a meeting of Academica Sinica, uh, Doctor Who passes away. And what happens then is also quite extraordinary. He's put in a funeral home in, in Taipei, and the Chinese name of this funeral home Yi Le Bing Yi Guan. That's the Elysium Funeral Home. is a very wonderful name for a funeral home. And forty thousand people come to visit his coffin. Forty thousand. And remember, he's an intellectual, and he's not a political leader. He's not a sports star or a singing leader, or you know, he's an intellectual. So this tells us the impact which he had on the whole of society. And there were tributes written to him from many people in Taiwan and, and around the world. And the one written by uh, Chen Cheng, who was the ROC prime minister at the time, this is the one we've chosen for our uh, Chinese uh, book title because it's so evocative. So this is the final slide. It's, again, I want to show you his, this is his, the spirit of Dr. Who. Always optimistic, curious, not arrogant, always in, willing to meet other people, to discuss with them, look positively for the future. So this, this photo was taken in Nangang in Taipei. So he's not in good health at this time, but it's still a very uh, inspiring picture. Anyway, that's the end of my uh, talk and I welcome your questions.